Hosting for the Dice Tower is generously provided by Cool Stuff, Inc. Cool Stuff, in stock, at CoolStuffInc.com. Thanks for your support. The Dice Tower, episode 440. Everything is awful. Welcome to the Dice Tower, a podcast about board games and card games, and especially the people who play them. On today's show, Mary compares Hyperborea to Orleon. Brian takes us to Tonga Bunga, and Dan lays down the rules to his game groups. Plus, we run through the events we expect to attend in 2016, we have a trio of tales to present, and we team up to discuss the recent announcement from Asmodee North America. I'm Eric Summerer. And here's your host, the Chicken Little of board gaming, Tom Vassell. Hey, can I be the Chicken Little from the movie Chicken Little? Because he was kind of cool. He was pretty cool. And that's what I meant the whole time. The sky was falling. Yeah, because of aliens. Oh, spoiled. Eric is just (laughs) I don't think that was spoiled. I think that was in the preview. Yeah, you're right. I think it was too. (laughs) The movie also has a happy ending. More spoilers. Oh, man. For a family movie? I'm trying to think of a family movie that doesn't have a happy ending. I'm sure there's something. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Well, anyhow, folks, if you're just joining us, my name is Tom Vassell. Hello, I'm Eric Summerer. And we're here to talk about board games. We would be remiss if I did not mention, though, that we are in the middle of our Kickstarter. Can you believe how well our Kickstarter is doing or not doing? I'm hoping it's doing really well. I, I hope it's not not doing anything. Uh, well, we, we we know in the future, future Eric and future Tom. Future Tom is a very rare bird. You hardly ever see him. It's true. He only comes in when it's like for the good of the country. Or or when future Eric does something particularly egregious. Crosses that line. <laughs> um, <laughs> Too far, sir. Hey there, uh, future Eric here with a quick shout out that Tom lost. I think it fell behind the desk or behind a mountain of games or something. David in Encitas, California, who wants to send a very special shout-out to my wife, Rowena, and my awesome kids, Ella and Jude. Even though it seems like you're beating me in almost every game we play, you are the absolute best gaming group that a guy could ask for. Thanks, David. Anyhow, if you have not listened to our last episode, I urge you to listen to it. We talk about our Kickstarter, and if you have not yet uh, donate it, and you think that the stuff we put out is worth donating to, we urge you to do so so that we can make it better and better. And thank you in advance. Yes. the Go to thedicetower.com for stuff about our show and other shows, and you can vote on our next top ten list. So I believe if you vote now and vote quickly, you might have a day or two, you can vote yep. on the best games of 2006, which is ten years ago. Yeah, I'm wow. still getting used to this 2016 thing. Yes. But if you missed that one, then you can vote on the best games from 2001, 15 Ooh. years ago. We are now yeah. – wow, this is really weird. Do you realize that it's only a few years away where the 15 years ago will be shows we've already recorded? That's that's terrifying. Nah, that just means we're getting older. <laughs> I'm excited. 2016 is the year I turned 40. Yeah. I mentioned this to my kids, and they're like, you've been old for a long time. That's what they said. <laughs> You're already old, Dad. Yes. I love them so very much. Okay. <laughs> well, let's get started. And We're talking about games. Here we go. First up for me, uh, Tom, you mentioned this, I think, in one of your 15 games in 15 minutes segments. So it was a very short review of The King is Dead. This is from Osprey Games. Uh, and it's an area control game, but you don't actually control the factions that you're you're trying to support. There's three factions on this map of England, and you are causing them to to sort of get presence in different zones, but you you don't belong to any of those factions in particular. In fact, at the end of the game, whoever has won the most zones, the most territories, they will win, and then whichever player has the most influence toward that faction wins the game. Uh, there are eight sections, eight provinces that you're going to be battling over, and you'll do them one at a time. There are these cards along the outside of the board, and this is the order you're going to uh, score these zones. And once a zone has been scored, 
you can't affect them anymore. That, that thing's shut down. You can't do anything to it. Each player has eight cards in their hand, so you can play multiple cards in a particular round, but then you will not be able to do anything during a future round. So you have to be very careful in how you spend your cards. You can also play this as a partnership game, which is what they recommend for a four-player game, and I actually enjoyed that quite a bit. When you play an action card, not only do you get to affect what happens on the board, so you may be adding cubes to the board, swapping them around, moving them, affecting the board in some way, you also must remove one cube from the board that goes in front of you, and that is what determines whether you influence that faction at the end. So I may play something that's going to give the yellow faction a nice strong presence in a province, but then if I want to be strong in yellow, I have to remove a yellow cube from the board and, and sort of play that area or the, the majority game off the board, which is tricky. You, you don't always realize when you play a card expecting something to happen, then you go, oh, wait, I have to take something off the board. And if I want a yellow cube, I'm reducing yellow's presence on the board somewhere. And that, that's tricky. Uh, you can also swap the order in which things get resolved. So if people are battling over one particular province, you can say, you know what? We're not resolving the, that one right now. We're going to resolve this one where red, has, there's no way red's not going to win this one. Uh, I found it really interesting. And the partnership um, is a lot of fun because... You, one partner can push hard in one section while the other one can hold back and save their cards for later. Um, neat game, and it plays relatively quickly and, and isn't one of those that promises to play quickly, but it, it you know doesn't. This, this is a, a fast-playing game with some depth and some difficult choices. The king is dead. I liked it. Well, good, good. It's, it's certainly it, – it's a, it's a unique game, I think, is the best thing I could sure. say for it. Although I think I've heard that it's it is based on an earlier design that I had not played. That's what I've heard also. Magic the Gathering the board games first expansion came out to like hmm. no fanfare. I uh, I wow. really feel like these guys are trying to kill their game. Oh, that's not that's that's disheartening. Well, it actually made me think of our in our last episode, we talked about the best games from 2011. Remember yeah. that? Mm-hmm. And one of the games on your original list was the Battleship game. Battleship Galaxies. Oh, man. Yeah, that game just died. Because they gave it zero support. Yeah. Now, this game has got at least one expansion, so we can be thankful for that. Hopefully There's there will something. be more. And you can now deck build a little bit. There's a new – two new summoner, uh, summoners, Planeswalkers – in the expansion, there's a giant monster that you can, like, fight two people versus one. One person controls the giant monster. There's more models and stuff. So now you can kind of deck build and kind okay. of build an army. Kind of. But they need, like, four more of these expansions before this comes out. I, 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 just, I guess it just boggles my mind because Magic the Gathering players like to build decks, right? Right, yeah. Why would they not follow the same concept with the board game? It's I mean, almost like they needed to ask. release an expansion with the original game. They really did. This should have been released with the original game. And then they they could release more stuff. They said that there's lots more stuff coming. I believe that that's true. But I, unless something changes, two years this is going to be gone. Yeah. It saddens me. But, but the expansion's fun. It adds a little bit more stuff. Not a ton. A little. Um, you, you now can, like, take... A different squad. There's three squads of each color now instead of two. Yay. <laughs> I, I, it's good. I, I know I, I might be sound like I'm complaining, but I want to go in and build a different army than other people have, and I can't do that yet. All right. Uh, the next game for me to talk about is called Cat Tube Famous. Oh, this, this is game a- showed up, and we have a, <laughs> we have a queue of th- yeah. 300 so games. Actually, it's probably like down to 270 or something. Oh, yeah. I believe this game is sitting on like Spot 269, I think. <laughs> well, you know, it, it was uh, on top of a pile for me as well, and we had our family game day, and my younger brother uh, picked it up and said, ooh, what's this about? And I said, well, that's one of the games that I need to play. He's like, well, we could play it right now. And I said, okay, let's do it. Um, in Cat Tube Famous, you have a, a whole bunch of cat videos, and you are 
publishing them in order to take advantage of various trends.、Uh, you, so you've got a hand full of these cat videos, and each cat video has trends that will earn them points.、Uh, so you always get a point simply for playing the card, but then there are a couple of traits that, if you match them, you'll get an additional point. And then there's a doubler trait, and if you match that, you double all your score up to that point. There's also a trait that, if you match that, you lose a point for that card. So each round you've got a number. I think it's four of these. So there's three traits that are face up. So they might have lazy, fat, rambunctious, and then there's one face down trait. So some mystery trait that is the trend right now, but you don't know what it is. And you go around the table, committing cards to this particular round, this battle. You can pass, save your cards for later because you're only going to get one card each round. So if you spend them all right now, you won't have a whole lot to work with later. So you have to pick your battles, and、uh, you commit one or more cards to this battle, or nothing, or pass. Once everyone has passed, you reveal all the videos, score them using what I just explained, and the highest total gets all of the trait cards, which are worth either one or two points each, and that goes into your score pile. You, everybody, draws a card. You repeat the process until the entire deck of trait cards is gone, and total up points. Uh, it is very light.、Uh, I have to give credit to the theme because the the cat videos are cute. They have little comments under each of them. The art design is is nice. It for what this is, it's entertaining, but it's very light, almost random.、Uh, you you just have to hope that your your cards match what the traits are at any given moment.、Uh, you can hold back and try and build up an arsenal to really push at some point, but there's not a whole lot of control. So. Well, I get to give him credit for the theme. This is a pass for me, but it's cute. Cat tube famous. I did not seek to own a copy of Game of Gnomes. Oh, but I got a copy. The reason I did not seek to own a copy of Game of Gnomes is because the game is really big. It's, it's、like、very large. Twice the size of a Ticket to Ride box, and then another half on top of that. And the reason it's so big is because inside the game box comes this mountain made of porcelain, I think, or something. I don't know what、it's, it is. Yeah, it's it's a heavy material. And there's little porcelain type. They look like、um, little gnomes in it, and they look like tree ornaments. They okay, probably are. So this game involves you moving these gnomes around. You have some cards, and you are using these cards to move from location to location. Getting gems from certain locations and going and selling them to other locations, eventually climbing up the mountain to get these super gems that you can go and sell. And there's a couple other things in the game, but I'm really kind of getting bored as I talk about it now because the game was not fun. Oh, yeah, it's unfortunate. The, the Lamont brothers who designed the game have designed some great games. In our last show, we talked about Poseidon's Kingdoms, which is an、yeah. excellent, excellent game. I sometimes wonder if they get more caught up in the How outrageous can we do the components? Yeah, it seems like each year they find an even more outrageous component. Last year was a gigantic dice tower type thing. The year before that was huge pieces, and the the huge pieces that year were unnecessary. The dice yeah, the tower, spellbound last, pieces. The dice tower. Oh, that's I'm sorry. That snowbound. Two. It was three years ago that they did those other huge pieces. Yeah, it just they they've done some great games. Snow tails and. Um, uh, the the sheep one, sheer panic. Yeah,、uh, sheer panic. And、uh, their first game, I I like these, but this game of gnomes did not work. It's essentially an action game. You get so many actions on your turn, so you take these actions and cards sp- take different actions to do, and you move from point to point. But it was, I mean, seriously, it's go pick up stuff and deliver it somewhere else. Do you have the right cards to be able to do that? In a four player game, you are absolutely bored. <laughs> While waiting for your turn to come up, there's nothing to do when it's not your turn, and、mm. it's if you remember those action point allowance games that Kramer did, yeah, to call and stuff where people had ten actions, and the problem with those games is in the down, they're they're it's cool, it's like ooh, you have lots of choices, but when、right. it's not your turn, it's like ah,、oh. you have to sit, you sit there and watch people think, right, and so you have this in this game, and you also have the cards, this whole mountain thing, you need to climb up it, you do, but it's. That's so unnecessary. It's it's not even really drawing people over to. They're like come over like, oh, that's a cool mountain. What do you use it for?、And、we move on it. Oh, what else? Nothing. Eh, like it could have been a flat track or or something、ah, made out of something. cardboard. It's 
the game, but even okay. So let's take all that out. The game is mediocre at best. Hmm. I, I, I there was nothing new or interesting there. Um, the board is okay. You're just like you're, I don't know. The game actually gets less interesting. I think as time goes by because when you go and sell, you're you're picking up mushrooms and selling up mushroom at villages for gems. Well, each village has three gems. One that's very good. One that's there's one that's worth three. One that's worth two. One that's worth one. So once you, someone has sold at the beginning of the game the, the, the mushrooms at the villages for three gems, it's not quite as interesting to sell them for two and then for one, right? Mm-hmm. There's, there's a small way that that's mitigated, but eh, overall, this is a huge pass for me, especially since the box is going to take up so much room. A big, giant box has to be worth being big and giant. Yeah. That's Game of Gnomes. For some time now, Tom has been tooting the horn of But Wait, There's More. I love it. Party game from Toy Vault. And uh, I picked up a copy in a Cool Stuff order a couple months ago, but hadn't brought it to the table until our summer or family game day after Christmas. And uh, this was a hit. Uh, you are selling products, and especially in the partnership game is where this really shines, where you, you are presented with a card like a broom. You're going to be selling a broom, and each partner in the partnership chooses a trait card uh, and and puts it face down, and then you begin a 30-second timer, and I didn't realize how quickly that 30-second timer goes. You have to rip through your pitch very quickly. So one player in the partnership starts talking and talks about this feature that makes this broom fantastic, And but wait, there's more, and passes it off to the, the partner, who then has their own trait that the first person didn't even know about. And has to inc- integrate that into the pitch. And then you add the that's the best part expansion where the person to their right has a question. But what happens if my child tries to get into it? But that's the best part and has to integrate that into the pitch. And then everybody votes after everyone has a chance to pitch the broom. These types of games can be a little tricky for players who are not as outgoing and not, not willing to be creative on the spot. Um, But because the trait cards already give you a lot of that idea to go with, um, it gives you a much better jumping off point than, say, uh, than than snake oil, which Tom has said, uh, you know, this replaces. And uh, with snake oil, you have to combine these two things into a concept and you have to do a little bit more of the work yourself. But this, you can just jump in with a trait card and it does this crazy thing and... You aren't quite as hampered by uh, writer's block or thinker's block uh, in the heat of the moment. So it, this worked better uh, with my family than Snake Oil. Although I still love Snake Oil, this one I think was a bigger hit with more people. And uh, it, it's one that I will hopefully be bringing out a lot more often. But wait, there's more. Huge thumbs up from the Summerers. Yeah, I'm glad you like it. He's good. He's good. Mess Machine is a cooperative, semi-co-op game, which you would assume automatically means I dislike it. Mm. But I do like the game because it actually works. The way Mess Machine works is there's a 16, is it 16 or is it 25? Two, two, no, it's 16. There's a 16-piece puzzle that's made up of squares of a toy. For some reason, you put the toy in the machine and it came out looking horrific. Mm. So you take these 16 tiles, there's, there's four things in a box so they're each a different picture so let's say there's a picture of a train you mix them all up and you put them there and it's all jumbled it reminds you of those little puzzles you play as a kid Mm -hmm. and then each person is going there's there's four ways that you can switch tiles you can switch two tiles that are next to each other in the same column or two that are next to each other in the same row or two that are have a tile in between them in the same column or row so there's four different actions you could take you're going to pick two of those actions secretly at the beginning of the game. One action will be your primary action. One will be your secondary action. And then players will, on their turn, take a token that matches one of the four actions and switch two pieces. If they get one of those pieces into the correct spot it's supposed to be, they get a point. So they're scoring points through the game. The game ends if you get the picture done correctly, although on higher difficulty levels, it can you can roll a die and a couple pieces will mess up halfway through. It's really irritating. Hmm. If that ends and you built a toy correctly, then you reveal your primary and secondary action. Your primary action, you get one point for each time you did that action. So let's say I said every time I my primary action is switching two tiles in the same row. 
that are next to each other. Every time I do that, I did that, I get an, I get a point. Your secondary action, you get two points for each time one of your opponents did that action. Hmm. So it's kind of fascinating because you look at the puzzle at the beginning. You're like, okay, we're going to be doing a lot of switching stuff in the same columns. So that's the action I'm going to take for my opponents to do. I bet they do a lot of that to get the puzzle where it's supposed to be. Hmm. See, if the puzzle is not completed, you only get score for your secondary action button. And you're also getting points for doing it right as you go along. So there's no incentive for you to mess things up, right? You don't want to mess things up. You don't want to lose points in this game. But you don't want to be forced to do your secondary action. You want other people to do that action. Hmm. It's really cool. It's not a long game. We're talking 20 minutes or so. Hmm. It's kind of cooperative because everyone's like, yeah, well, you should move that piece there. Oh, are you telling me to move that piece there because that's the right thing to do? Or is it because I'm scoring you two points by doing that? I hmm. really thought it was a cool idea. Very clever. That's Mess Machine. Huh. Last for me is a family-slash-kids game called Splash. This is a dexterity game that comes in a tin kind of like Spot It, that same size tin. Uh, this was Tom's review copy um, that I played while he wasn't looking. Uh, at Essen, we uh, we had some uh, review copies in the booth, and Barry Doublet and I were... Um, were bored, and so we pulled out this game and played it while we were chatting with with Dice Tower fans. And uh, so we we played this game. Uh, You have a bunch of different colored pieces in different shapes. They're all tiny, like the little wooden sticks. Uh, There's a hexagonal piece, almost like standard board game pieces uh, in squares and hexes and different three-dimensional shapes. And you are trying to stack them. But you are telling your opponent what piece they're going to stack on their turn. But you have to do it, you have to build Uno style. So either you are building the same shape or the same color uh, that is already on the top of the stack. So if I've I've just put a white hex on the stack, now I need to tell my opponent uh, that he has to use either a white piece or uh, or another hex. And, uh, and you continue going until somebody knocks something over or, uh, or they can't play. You can sort of force them into not being able to play and you'll earn points and you play a certain number of rounds. Uh, it, it, was, it was quick. It was simple. It was um, not just see how well you can stack. There was a little bit of strategy and, uh, you know, juggling for position in, in what options are available for your opponent. I thought it was a lot of fun. Splash with an exclamation point. Hmm. 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 I'm starting to think there's too many exclamation points in games. Yeah, they're all very excited. But wait, there's more! Splash! Sometimes there's two exclamation points. Well, that's that's excessive. That's just too much. I just was noticing that abstract games often capitalize every letter in the name. Hmm. Like they're an acronym. There's a lot of secret rules to naming games. Speaking of which, the, the game I'm going to talk about now has changed its name. It originally was called Telepathy... Now it's called Magic Minds, and then Telepathy Very Small. Or Brain Freeze, and then Telepathy Very Small. What? Telepathy is a two-player game. Brain Freeze is a kid's version. Magic Minds is the version for normal people. (laughs) For normal-sized people. (laughs) Let me rephrase that. For adults, I guess. But although kids can play both. In this game, I, I may have talked about this in the show before. We'll talk about the Magic Minds version. There's an 18 by 18 grid. The rows are numbered. The columns are lettered. And in each square of the grid, there is a different picture that's a different color. So you're going to pick one of those to be your target for the other person. So it might be red crystal ball. That's an A7. Okay. So I marked that down. On your turn, you call out one of the squares in the grid. So you might say C6. The blue magic wand. And I'll say, you sunk my battleship. No. Mm-hmm. I say either yes or no. If I say yes, that means one of those traits is correct. It's either in C or in six or it's blue or it's a magic wand. Okay. If I say no, that means it's none of those things. None of those. And you have these uh, erasable markers, and so you are slowly but surely figuring out where your opponent's square is. First person to do that is the winner. Okay. No's are great because they cancel four traits. 
Yeses are also great if you get a, several of them because you can narrow down where your opponent is. It's really fun. The brain freeze, the kids one is the same thing. There's just fewer rows and columns, and every picture is of some sort of ice cream. <laughs> okay. Which which made me want to play it. Yeah, sure. I want to eat ice cream right now, but I'm going to eat a salad instead. <laughs> okay. I, I vaguely recall you talking about this. But I don't know if I, that was that that's actually the case. But I remember if I was hearing it before, being excited about it then as well. Yeah, I, I, I seem to think that they said they sent one to you. Oh, well, I haven't seen it myself. No. Too bad. Maybe they sent it to somebody, saw another Eric. <laughs> what a horrible story! <laughs> and now, another tale of board gaming horror. Gather round, children. It was at the time when Camel Up was the latest hotness for family games in Germany, even before it won the Spiel des Jahres, when our small family of four visited a local convention. When my son saw that they were holding a Camel Up tournament, he decided to enlist. We had played the game a few times before, and even my son considered it a light game, so it shouldn't be a problem, he thought. I told him that the tournament was for adults and that I didn't think they would allow eight-year-old boys to take part. But he had made up his mind and walked away from our table on his mission to enter this tournament. First, I was a little wary and thought about accompanying him. But young birds have to learn to fly. From where we sat, we could watch him running into the first problem. The list to enlist for the tournament had been hung high up a wall, way out of his reach. Curious how he would manage that situation, I watched as he approached one of the staff members calling out for help. The young, very tall man, obviously, he was the one hanging the list that high, offered to write my son's name onto the list, but my son insisted that the list be hung lower so that he could enter his name by himself. That was the first time I felt very proud of him that day. My son then went straight into the room the tournament would be held. A lot of people had entered the tournament, so I guessed it would take a while and started playing games with my daughter, my wife, and some friends we met. After more than three hours had passed and I hadn't seen my son nor heard anything of him, I started to worry a little bit. I decided to go see if he was still playing or if he was watching the other players. I entered the tournament room just the moment the final round in the finals was played. My son was obviously one of eight players making it into the final. That was the second time I felt very proud of him that day. One player rolled the dice. The frontmost camel crossed the finish line and the game was over. The referees were tallying up the points and declared the winners. First place was a woman my age and second place a younger man. The third place was a tie between another man and my son. As soon as this was declared, he jumped up in the air yelling, Yes, I did it! When he saw me, he ran into my arms, beaming at me full of joy. That was the third time I felt very proud of him that day. Then the prizes were handed out to the winners. The organizer in charge had a stack of three games he was handing out to the three adults. And that was it. You must imagine the look my son gave me. He asked me why he didn't get a prize. He was third place as well. I immediately approached the three other winners and the organizer and asked them what was going on. The organizer told me with no sign of regret that they only had three prizes and that they decided to give them to the adults. A boy of eight could surely go without a board game, and that they had no toys to give to him. I was shocked, not only by the words of the organizer, but also by the reaction of the other three winners. They all nodded in agreement and started to leave with their prizes. I stopped them and asked if they think that this was fair at all. What a message to send to a young boy— but nobody cared. Only a young lady, part of the team of organizers, went away and came back with a used board game out of the collection of the convention to give it to my son. It was a game about cute little bunnies for kids aged three to four. My son was torn between sadness and anger. 
we immediately left the convention. I offered him to stop at our friendly local game store. I would get him the prize he deserved, but my son declined. No, he said with a firm voice, that wouldn't make their wrong right. That was the fourth time I felt very proud of him that day. Until that very day, my son has never played. Since that very day, my son has never played a game of Camel Up again, and firmly refuses to do so. Moo ha 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 ha. Maybe we should call this a tale of rage because I'm really ticked off. Yeah, me too. Me too. Mm, that boo! makes me sad. Sadness. I want to know what convention this was. Better not be Dice Tower. <laughs> I, did, I hope not. No, this is in Germany somewhere. Ah, uh, boo. Don't do this, people. Did he say it was in Germany? Uh, he, yeah, he said it was big in Germany at that, at that point. I, you know, th- that was a tough situation. I'm sure they had three prizes. And they had four winners, but there should have been some, you know, maybe third place they split in some way. They must have had some other thing to do to to completely write off one of the players who legitimately played the game. Ah. Ah. Angry. All right. Well, today is a day of tales. Uh, But before we get to our next tale, I wanted to mention... Um, some of the conventions we're going to this year, so you guys might have a chance to come by and see us. Yeah. Um, first of all, there is the – let's see. In M- M- March, we're going to the Gamma Trade Show. Yeah. So we'll be doing our full coverage from that. In April, I'll be going to the Gathering of Friends. Hopefully, I'll be able to get some – me and Z will be going to that. Hopefully, I'll be getting some interviews with designers and publishers and so on. Uh, for May, Sam and I will be going to the UK Gaming Expo, which I will take lots of pictures, and we'll see. We've never been there, so that one sounds like fun. Hopefully, if you're there, we'll be doing a live show from there. That'll be our first live show of the year. Um, are you crying? A little bit, a little bit. <laughs> in June, oh no, that's in June. I'm sorry, that's June. In May, we're going to the Cool Mini or Not Expo. Hmm. That will be me, Z, and Sam going to that one. June is the UK Gaming Expo. And then June is also Origins. Yes. And we'll all be going there. Yes. And we'll be doing our second live gaming show of the year at Origins. Yes. In July, we'll be doing Dice Tower Con. And we'll do, be doing our third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh live shows of the year. <laughs> do we, we have four scheduled? No, I don't know what we got. We got a pile scheduled there probably. Same thing we did this year. Yeah, we usually do a, a, a top ten list. Uh, for video, and then we have the Dice Tower Awards announcing in a live show there. Plus well, I'll tell you what we're stuff. not doing this year, Eric. We're not going to schedule a late Saturday night Wits and Wagers game. Oh, okay. Because we were really zonked last year at that, if you remember. we It was a little odd. We also arrived late, like at the last minute. Yes, we had to run to get there and everything, so probably that won't happen. We'll be doing the Flip the Table show there instead. Cool. Um, and then after in August is Chen Con, mm-hmm. and we hope to be doing a live show there. I'm working on that now with the Chen Con organizers. Nice. Hopefully September, more tickets. We'll be doing a, I'm sorry? Hopefully more tickets than we had last year. Hopefully. We, we tried and are like, oh, are you sure you need more room than last year? And I just, I really want to like drive up there and... <laughs> Did Punch they not the see I, that we had a line? Anyway. Uh, it's annoying. The guy's like, well, you know that that room is in demand, the bigger room. We're like, we know. That's why we're asking for it. Yes, exactly. <laughs> then August, uh, that is August. September will be at a small convention, which I don't believe has a name yet, that's in Connecticut. Hmm. Which seems awfully convenient for Eric. It does. I think I'll be there, probably. October will be at Essen. I believe all of us will be at Essen. That's the plan. All of us will be at the Connecticut one, too. And then um, November, I don't know what we'll be at in November. We haven't decided on November yet. Mm. And December, Dice Tower Cruise. Now, Dice Tower Cruise is scheduled. It's launched. I don't know if it's full yet or not. Watch our website for information about that. There were people who've already emailed me over the past year wanting more information on the cruise. Those people have first shot at the rooms. But if there's other open rooms, we will make that available. And that may have already happened or is happening very soon. Hmm. 
So anyhow, Eric, did you get any games for Christmas? Uh, I actually didn't. My son got Timeline, uh, which we've had had a lot of fun playing uh, recently. What else? Um, that's been it for me. Mostly video games for for my youngest son. The Lego stuff he's really into right now. All right, I got no games either, but I never <laughs> want games. I got BB-8. Oh, did you get the little remote control one with the app? Yeah, my kids, my wife bought it for me. That's cool. I would not have bought it for myself because I think it's kind of expensive. But I feel like I have a pet now. <laughs> nice. I know. I mean, I turn them on, just let them run around the room. Cool. Yeah, I, I don't know how to explain it. I like help up in my chair, and I feel like this warmth towards a droid. <laughs> but I don't have to feed him. Cool. So you just good. have to charge him. Yeah, I really like it. It's a cool little toy. Nice. All right, well, that was our niceness. Now let's go to not niceness. Tale of Outrage! For a very long time, a Game of Thrones, the board game, second edition, was the star of our game group and my collection. More often than not, we'd get together with the only intention of playing this game, plus some fillers until all six players arrive. The group was about 12 people strong, So the tables were different each time, but a time came along when we had taken into account all previous plays, a grand total of six different winners. And so it was settled. A game would be played, featuring all six past winners. It would require coordination to get that exact roster to meet on a given day, but the prize was worth it. The title of Champion of the Game of Thrones Master Series. After much deliberation, a date was set. One of the players said that he could get there early and start a barbecue. That's nice, I thought. We could have some sandwiches done by the time we start the game. Thing is, we were discussing all this using the same group email that we used for our regular games. And slowly but surely, some people started replying. Hey guys, if you're going to do a barbecue, I'd love to go. I'll just watch the game, it'll be cool. All right, I thought. A couple of people, that ain't so bad. The gaming group is 12 people. It can't be worse than that. It could. Some guys started inviting friends. Other friends invited others. By the time I got there, at 9 p.m., there were no less than 30 people. And one of the players for the game was barbecuing for all that crowd. It was madness. I had gone there with my wife. She's not a gamer at all, and she certainly wasn't part of the Game of Thrones match, but she is usually patient with my hobby. At that point, she was about a month pregnant, although only the two of us knew. At about 10 p.m., I said to some of the guys, Look, it's all good. I'm not mad or anything, but there's no way we'll play this game tonight. Oh, no, they said. It'll be all right. Why don't you start setting it up and we'll get to it fast enough? They didn't. It was past 12 a.m. when the game was about to start. Most of the guests not in the match were gone, and my wife, having spent three hours with a crowd she's not really fond of, was looking at another six grueling hours of board gaming madness. After a couple of rounds of the game, she told me she was absolutely bored. I understood, and I gave her money for a taxi ride home. The game went on. The stakes were being raised when I received a phone call. Honey, I'm sorry, but it seems I left home without the keys. I'm in our apartment's hallway. Everything's all right. I'll just, like, wait here till you come back. The next half hour was spent trying to agree to a course of action with my wife while the signal for both our phones was acting up. I offered to pay a taxi ride back if she would stay until we were done. I offered to send her the keys on another taxi and ask her to open the door for me when I got home. I'm pretty sure I came up with two or three other suggestions, each more intricate than the last. None convinced her and I wasn't going to leave her out in the hallway, and I must admit there was a fair amount of guilt throwing during the discussion. At some point, my phone's battery started to run out. I asked our host if he could give me a charger and continued to talk to her. A little bit later, still on the phone, I saw him still sitting at the same spot and asked again, this time a bit more sternly. This sequence repeated itself about four times until finally my phone died. At this point, everything that had been wrong about that night... The extra guests, the late hour at which the game started, my wife forgetting her keys, and the guest holding his thumbs while I was asking for a favor all rushed to my brain at the same time. I stood in front of him and said, Didn't you hear me asking for a charger? 
Yeah, I did, was his reply. And why didn't you get me one? Because I got lazy. I grabbed the leg of his chair with one hand, the back with another, and upended the chair as he was sitting on it. I then left from my home. The Master Series was never ended or restarted. In fact, the group has moved away from a Game of Thrones into other, shorter games. I am not proud of what I did, but I don't regret it. And I'm pretty certain that if you put me in that position again, I'd do the exact same thing. <laughs> I, I don't feel too badly for him there, though. I think he put himself uh, in a bad situation. I guess. Like, he took his wife along to watch him play Game of Thrones. Yeah, that was, that was not that was not. I good. don't know. All right. One more tale to go. I, I have to say, all three tales that I picked out today, <laughs> I just really enjoyed them. So... So, uh, <laughs> try this one. Welcome to Cult of the Old, where I discuss games we may have forgotten about or games that fail miserably, but still had some good mechanics in. This is Brian Counter, and everything I do is counterproductive. Today, I wanted to talk about Tonga Bongo, designed by Stefan Dora in 1998, rated rank 6.49 and 2381 on Board Game Geek. Tonga Bongo is a family style game that's kind of a race and kind of betting, and it has dice. This is not a typical roll and move game, even though from the outset it may look like it, but more on that later. Players will move their ships around a bunch of islands and try and be the first to get there and drop off a cube representing some kind of encampment or something. And if you're first there, you get a money bonus and money's your victory points. And if people come in behind you and drop their cubes off, they have to pay you a little bit as well. So that will help you. Now, the cool part about the map is there are some very well-designed choke points, as if players want to move past another ship, they have to use up a few movement points, and it slows them down. So it makes an interesting set of choices as to where to move and who's in front, who's going to get there first. Players move their ships around the board until one player has distributed four cubes and returns home. That's not necessarily the winner, though. The winner is the one with the most money. And that's all well and good, but where the game actually becomes interesting is the betting phase and the use of dice. You see, each ship has three spots, a captain and two others, and players will put money out in two of the three slots for how much they're willing to pay that position. Then going around the table, each player rolls their three dice and puts them how they want on any ship but their own, and what's going to happen is, at the end of the round, if they have the highest roll for the captain, let's say, they get the betting money that the player put out for that slot. For example, if a player put out five coin and three coin for captain and then the second slot, the respective of players who had their dice there would get the five and the three. If a higher dice gets rolled by a later player, they can push other players' dice down the slot to lesser amounts or no amounts. And then when it becomes the movement phase of the player's ship, the one you couldn't put any of your own dice on, moves the amount of spaces as indicated by the dice put on the ship. So obviously you don't want to just put out one and one as a bet to pay your shipmates because no one's going to put their higher dice on there. You want the higher dire movement so your ship can move more, but you obviously Obviously, don't want to put way too much money on that because that's your victory points as well. So it's an interesting choice to find the fulcrum of attractiveness and non-loss for victory points. Note that when the player throws their three dice, their standard D6 is with numbers 1 through 5, but that 6 is replaced by an icon showing someone getting seasick off the side of the ship. Now, it doesn't actually show someone throwing up, but that's what it implies. Now, I know that I can be boyishly immature at times, but I can't help it. This just makes me laugh. My rationalization being that I know I'm being immature, but still, it's just stupid fun. And if enough people roll seasick guys, some of the ships aren't going to move much. And that's part of the fun, as the hurlers don't get used on anybody's ship. So that's pretty much the game. What intrigues me is the use of other people's dice and your ships. There are other games that use dice in more complex ways or in sometimes neater ways. But this is a neat concept for an earlier game. It works well and it's usually quick. Of course it's die rolling so it's prone to some randomness factors, but the game is short enough to where it shouldn't matter. This game is well out of print and not easy to find, but there's a few copies on Board Game Geek that are reasonable. This is actually easier to find in Europe. But if you find it at a thrift store or something cheap, by all means, pick this one up if this sounds anywhere appealing. It can be fun. Tonga Bonga. And now, the ins and outs of forming a board game group with Dan Hughes.
Hello, Dan Hughes here from the Noble Order of Huddersfield Board Gamers, and I'm here to continue my ongoing series about setting up your own board gaming club. Today, I'm going to be talking about whether you should set up some rules or guidelines for your club. Now, this actually is quite a difficult question to answer. On one hand, it's very useful to have an agreed set of behaviours that you expect everyone in the group to adhere to. It means that if at some point in the future, you find yourself with a member that's acting inappropriately or antisocially, you're able to approach that person, point to the guidelines and say, look, we already agreed that this kind of stuff wasn't acceptable. So get down from the table, take off the bunny ears, and please, Simon, put on some trousers. Now, even if you do have some guidelines to use like that, that's not going to be a pleasant conversation and will be very difficult to have. But at least with the backup of the pre-existing guidelines or rules, any issues you raise aren't going to come out of the blue and they're going to give you a solid base to stand on while you have the discussion. Also, they'll protect you in some way from feeling like you're bullying the person or picking on the character flaws. These aren't issues you have with a person as an individual. These are a set of guidelines that have been agreed within the group and are generic and apply to absolutely everybody. The downside of having a stated set of guidelines or rules in your group is that you might come across as quite pompous, officious and bureaucratic. The kind of people who like setting up committees and appointing chairs and treasurers and secretaries and sitting around telling other people what to do. Like some kind of horrific power-hungry suburban neighbourhood watch scheme. There may be a point in the games club's development where a committee is appropriate but I'd argue that comes further down the line when it grows to hundreds of members and becomes big and unwieldy. At the beginning, you want to be as streamlined as possible. The other danger in drawing up a set of rules is that if you make them too specific and focused, they can become overcomplicated and inflexible and difficult to apply to various situations. On the other hand, if you make them too broad and generalised, you might get a situation where you could argue everybody's breaking the rules, making the whole process pretty pointless. So you have to pitch the complexity and the tone just right. If you are going to set up some guidelines and rules for the group, it's vitally important that you involve as many of the members in that process as possible. The worst thing you could do would be to decide these rules on your own without any input. It has to be a collaborative exercise. Otherwise, you've got no real right expecting other people to conform to them. When my group, the Noble Order of Huddersfield Board Gamers, reached around 100 members, we decided it was about time that we set up our own guidelines. And while every group's different, and will have different requirements, I thought it might be useful to some people to let you know what we decided on. So here then are our guidelines. Be polite. Be welcoming, tolerant and inclusive towards your fellow gamers. Be welcoming to new people. Be a good winner and be a good loser. Racism, sexism, homophobia or any other discrimination is not acceptable. Be attentive when being taught a game, and be patient while others learn. Don't sacrifice other people's enjoyment for the sake of your own. Be careful with other people's games. If you damage someone's game, be prepared to replace it. Don't cheat. And most importantly, have fun. So there you go. Whether you choose to have rules or not in your group is really up to yourselves. I wouldn't say they're a necessity, but they do give you a leg to stand on should you have to deal with any antisocial behaviour within the group. And that's about it from me today. Please come over to the Dice Tower Guild on Board Game Geek and let us know if your group has any rules, and if you do, what they are and how they're working out for you. Thanks for listening. Tidbits and Gaming Tips with Mary Prasad. Hello gamers, Dicey Chic here. In this segment, I wanted to do a short comparison between Hyperborea and Orleans. Eventually, I'll write up a full comparison and review to be posted at Opinionated Gamers, so look for that. At first glance, these two games look like they're worlds apart. Hyperborea has miniatures and a modular board, whereas Orleans looks more like a traditional Ural. Looks can be deceiving, though. Hyperborea and Orleans both have the same driving mechanism, a bag draw to determine your actions each round. In the case of Hyperborea, you're drawing cubes that will be placed on your player mat and on technologies in order to trigger them. In Orleans, you are drawing chits to be placed on your player mat and in buildings in order to trigger them. In Hyperborea, your miniatures can move from place to place, triggering actions, fighting ghosts or other players, and scoring at the end of the game for majorities. The fighting is pretty simple. If you have an attack action, you basically win. The game is set up so that fighting other players probably isn't going to be a high priority, and losing your piece isn't usually much of a problem. 
Orleans has meeple figures you can move around on a map to collect resources and set up trading posts that score at the end of the game. Each city can only hold one trading post with the exception of Orleans. In both of these games, there are several ways to score points. Both games are highly rated on BGG, ratings I believe they both deserve. I've played each several times and encourage you to try them as well. Hello, I'm Skip Hampton with yet another tale of betrayal. My fiancé, Brittany, and I hosted a game night amongst four of her friends from the university physics department. I chose to play the resistance. They weren't into the hobby like Brittany and I are, and I thought accusing and yelling at each other would be fun. It's also easy to teach to non-gamers. After explaining the rules and letting them read them, we were ready to play. I should note here that I should have realized after all three wanted to individually read the rules, playing with these physics grad students was going to be an endeavor. The cards were dealt. I peeped at my card, and there was the red card of the spy. We all closed our eyes, and the spies revealed themselves. It was me and the Chilean student. We acknowledged each other, bowed our heads. Brittany told us all to open our eyes, and the Venezuelan student immediately yelled out, I'm the spy! We were all baffled. What was he thinking? He then recanted. Yelling ensued. You can't do that. Are you... Is he? Brittany yelled out. His argument after the game was that it was all about intrigue and deception, like the box read. The Chilean and myself knew that he was not, in fact, a spy, but we could use this confusion to our advantage. No one would put him on a mission. Great. Each mission seemed to drag on. Every decision that was made by the others had to be worked over, mulled over, and reworked again like solving equations that would unlock the mysteries of the cosmos. Even my own spy mate suffered immensely from analysis paralysis. I would try to give him looks as if to say, what are you doing? Don't make them overthink it. They will know. Finally, it was down to the wire, the last mission of the game, the mission that would either see the resistance through or see them crumble. This round was no different than the others. Brittany was in charge of sending the team off on the mission. Herself, obviously, but who else? Analysis paralysis took hold. Everyone was tracing the steps that led up to this moment. Even my own comrade was slowing things down and making things worse for us. The group was figuring it out. The Venezuelan student was pardoned of his mistake and added to the mission. I begged to go, trying to prove my fealty to Brittany. I needed to fail that mission. In a moment of sheer panic, I broke character, teared up slightly as to appear mad and yelled out, This is why I don't like playing with physics people. You all overthink it and it's not fun. I'm not a spy. Expletive deleted. Please put me on this mission so we can win this. My performance was so good and so moving. The room fell silent. Brittany looked at me baffled and reached out to me. Whoa, are you crying? It's just a game. Don't get so upset. I looked at her, bleary-eyed. I'm sorry. I'm just not the spy, and I want to win this for us. This game has been going for so long. We need this win. We need it. After a moment of silence, I was put on the team. The cards flipped one by one. Pass. Pass. Fail. The bomb had hit. The Chilean student and I immediately stood up and high-fived. The others were floored. I had given the performance of my life and it had worked. In the games of the Resistance before and after, I like to change up the way I play my characters as not to give myself away when I am the spy. We usually play with the same group of people. The secret weapon I used that day, though, was special because I can never use it again. It was one for the books, as they say. Okay, bye. <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. I don't know that I've ever resorted to fake crying in a game <laughs> to get my way. Oh, yeah. That, that would be really horrible. Because if, if someone pulled that on me, I would feel really bad. Yeah. And then never trust them again. For Th- the that's rest the of thing that, that like ruins your credibility for future games, like forever. I mean, you, to to pull that card because you're you're actually asking people to say, or like you know, out of game. Come on, guys, be human. 
please. It's like the guy who who stands up in the werewolf game and like throws a chair. Like I, I'm telling you guys, I'm not a werewolf. Like really well, breaking character but, and freaking out. Well, he wasn't a werewolf. He wasn't. Oh, I can't remember now. I don't you, think you, he was. The, when you told it before, you said he was. Oh, maybe he was. Ah. Uh. I mean, if you pull that card, if you you play that card, it's you're. You're trying to play to an out-of-game relationship. And I think once you've done that once, people are not going to believe you again. It's it's really a boy-crying-wolf situation. You might think that, but I still believe Z after all his lies. <laughs> I guess. I, I actually view that as a little uncool. I mean, if you're, if you're asking somebody to, to give you some slack out-of-game... And then to have done it for an in-game purpose, I, I'm not really comfortable with that. <laughs> I'm, well, again, as you mentioned, it's only going to happen once. <laughs> right. You get to do it one time. That's it. Uh, also, you may not get asked to play again. Yeah. So. Yeah. All right. We're about to get to the question of the week, but let me explain what our question of the week is about. It's about Asthma Day. And Asthma Day and Fantasy Flight Games and Days of Wonder are now all one company called Asthma Day North America. Or A N A, or whatever we're going to call it. Sure. They made this announcement, and that's one thing to make that announcement. The CEO of this company is Christian Peterson, who obviously seems to have come out pretty well in his uh, merger of Asmodee and Fantasy Flight. Sure. But they uh, they made it a very vague announcement. Then they made another vague clarification to that announcement, where essentially they are going to be changing the distributors down to five, or in Days of Wonders' case, up to five distributors, Mm. which are the five largest. They are also going to be trying to help local stores by selling only to select online retailers, and those online retailers have to sell for a – that they're going to sell to them for a different price than they're going to sell to the stores. So online retailers will not be able to – discount as much as they were previously that's all we know Mm -hmm. let's see what people's reactions to it are it's time for the dice towers question of the week sponsored by cool stuff inc in which our team of gaming experts answers one of your questions thus increasing the odds that someone will get it right this week's question What's your reaction to the recent announcement from Asmodee North America? This is Jared Whitley of Board Game Breakfast. On this subject, my opinion is divided. I think renaming Days of Wonder to Asmodee North America is a fine idea because Days of Wonder is really a one-game company and the name Ticket to Ride carries a lot more weight than Days of Wonder. Honestly, if you're going to rename that company, make it something that directly ties into its most successful property like Ticket to Wonder or Ticket to Asmodee. Otherwise, bringing it under the Asmodee banner seems logical. However, doing the same for Fantasy Flight does not. Fantasy Flight has such an amazingly strong reputation as the creator of dynamic games with extraordinary components. I don't know why you would ever sacrifice that brand identity. Seems like a waste. Hey, this is Patrick. And this is Jeremy. Uh, Blue Peg, Pink Peg, lots of thoughts. But in a nutshell, I would say I think this is the manifestation of the anxiety of our community about its growth and it becoming a little more mainstream. I mean, we're afraid of losing something that's very unique and personal to us. And yeah, we're afraid of not being able to buy as many games and maybe having to pay a little bit more. But I think that's really a manifestation of that sort of general anxiety of the fact that, you know, this may be slipping away from us. And I think it's too early for that. I, I don't think we can say that. But I do think that we've got that fear and people's response to this is sort of an indication of that. Right. I think it's not unlike having a favorite indie band Mm -hmm. that goes big and it's something that you feel very uh, passionate about, um, something that's quality you really appreciate and you're afraid that maybe when they reach out farther, they are going to lose a little bit of that. But I think it's important to remember that um, those indie bands are often starving and they're away from their families. And the equivalent here is maybe we're seeing uh, companies get bigger, more more professional uh, and able to reach a broader, broader audience, which isn't a bad thing. Yeah. I'm Eric Dewey. And I'm Isaac Shalev. From On Board Games. This Asthma Day announcement has me thinking that they're really interested in all the great experiences that players are having in stores. And they want to make sure that stores are going to have tournaments and stores are going to be a welcoming place for players to play and also to buy games. 
And so that's why I think Asmodee is looking at those online retailers and telling them, folks, you might not get your products on day one, or you might have to pay a bit more for them because we can't sustain 40% discounts. Yeah, that makes sense. Although my personal thought is, is that the some of the big guys like Cool Stuff and Fun Again that have the brick and mortar and the online, I feel they will be making their own sort of arrangements on the side with Asmodee, kind of negotiate something to keep where they're normally at in the marketplace. Yep, and we've already seen CSI raise its prices on some FFG Star Wars product. Uh, so higher prices in the short run, but maybe better experiences in stores in the long run. Well, I'm Eric Dewey. And I'm Isaac Shalev. From Onboard Games. Tony Marty from Rolling Dice and Taking Names. The Asmodee announcement, I'm not really sure what to think of this, other than I think it needs a little bit more time to bake. They keep releasing things saying, this is what we meant. This is what we really meant to say. So let's give it a little bit more time. What do you think, Marty? I'm not sure what to think of the Asmodee announcement yet i mean it's great that you want to support the local game stores which is nice but for those who don't have a local game store nearby i hope that they aren't hindered by these new guidelines to where they can't get these games at a good price online hey luke from the broken meeple here this ffg asthma day announcement Ooh, it's hard to tell what's going to happen with this a lot of what they've said has been very vague and mostly just pr nonsense what most people seem to be a bit concerned with is whether this is going to make the pricing point for a lot of games released by them, including LCGs, more expensive and thus out of people's price ranges. So we're going to have to wait and see what happens in the new year for more details on this. But let me put it this way. As with they, you're treading on dangerous waters here. You better be careful. Yeah, a lot of wait and see language there. I I didn't realize, are the imprints of Days of Wonder and FFG going away? Or is it just that the blanket company now has an official name? I think so. I mean, I would be amazed if Mr. Peterson got rid of the Fantasy Flight logo. Yeah, yeah, that doesn't doesn't make sense. Because some people, I mean... Some people don't even realize who owns Fantasy Flight at this point. They just see the FFG logo on something, and they're like, yeah, that's that's a company I get behind. Not knowing that they're related to anything else in the grand cornucopia of Asmodee. Maybe they're going to merge them more so that the Fantasy Flight will only be used on things like X-Wing and Armada and Descent. Maybe, and like Maybe there's going to be like... some new branding on stuff that'll say Asmodee North America. I, I, I don't know. The, I really dislike the vague language that's been used here. What everybody wants to know is, is my favorite online retailer still going to be able to sell the games? Um, and anytime somebody asks that, we get a sort of a vague announcement or a vague statement. Uh, and there's no cut and dry answers, and a lot of this isn't going to come into play until April of 2016. Uh, so we won't really know until that happens. Ultimately, I don't think this is the end of the world. It, it will probably mean that your favorite online retailers will be selling these games at a higher rate. But the, que- the big question is, will my favorite online retailer be able to sell them at all? That's the worry. You know, can I still go to Cool Stuff and get my favorite line of games? I, st- I think yes. I think they're still going to be available. Um, but yeah, I think prices are going to move. And there's lots of reasons for that. It could just be that the company wants to be able to pay their employees better. So I'm I'm in a wait and see situation. Um, I I I don't think it's the end of the world. I think we're all going to be okay. It's fine. Well, we're definitely going to be okay um, because let's say that it's that, that that let's let's take the worst scenario, right? That they're like, ah, oh, we're not selling online anymore, which is not what they said, and is yeah, not. Yeah, I don't think happen. that's happening. And you can only and we're going to raise the price at all our games by fifty percent. Okay, let's. I mean, let's let's be outrageous here. Let's say they did that. Okay. We'd be okay because we would then go buy from other companies. Yeah, it's true. Asmodee does not own all the games. They don't even own 25% of the games. It may seem like they do sometimes. <laughs> yeah. But they but they really they really don't. Yeah. Um I mean, if, if you're a f- but if you're a fan of a particular line and so in your mind you're buying these things no matter what. And then you're going to be very angry if you're now forced to pay more right, right, for right. them. No, I understand that. I'm just saying that it's not like it's the end of the world because other companies, let's say they went ridiculous and sold things for super high prices, you would be able to buy from other companies' games. Maybe right. not Star Wars and maybe not Descent and maybe not the Time Stories and things like that. 
Um, well, how, I'd be pretty upset if I couldn't get time stories, though. Yes, I understand that. But again, that's the worst case scenario, which isn't happening. You will be able to buy them online. You will likely have to pay more. Um, so that means you're going to have to come to the choice of are you willing to pay more or are you not going to buy these things? See, I, I, I think people have gotten so used to not paying MSRP. Oh, sure. That anything that's MSRP is horrible. The, some, the arguments have boiled down to some people like, I don't have a, a, a good store near me. Well, that's fine. You'll still be able to buy online. Your choices will be fewer probably and they'll be more expensive, but they'll still be cheaper than you could buy it at the store. Yeah. So you're still getting a discount, just not as much as you got before. And if that's too much for you to buy, well, that's that's life. There's a lot of things I can't afford, and yet – so I just don't get them. And if there's other cheaper games to get, we can get them. But the biggest thing that I, I really want to emphasize is, is this, is that we don't know exactly what's happening. It's not happening till April. And yes, boo to Asmodee and Fantasy Flight for putting out – I would have rather they put out no press release at all. Right. Than the very, very just strangely worded one that they put out. Right. And, and even the clarification didn't clarify much. Oh, my goodness. It did not. Uh, and I don't like that they're raising their prices. I don't know why – I mean anyone would be happy that they raised their prices. At the same time, doesn't – don't companies have to raise their prices at some point? I, that, I guess that's what bother, boggles my mind. People say they're greedy. And I've asked people online this, this question. I still haven't got a good answer. When is raising your price not greedy? How much are you allowed to raise it before? Right. It What's the percentage greedy? that's okay for a bit, like a cost of living or materials increase? Or There's, there's going to be a lot of stuff that goes up in price just because of inflation. Geek Chic is raising all the prices on their tables. Mm-hmm. They're charging well, way overcharging for their tables, but they have a premium product, so they can do that. I don't right. see them getting hate for that per se. Apple makes a living off this stuff. Um, as when they may be moving in that direction with Fantasy Flight, hey, we got a premium product, you pay for it. Hmm. I don't know that I agree with that. Or certainly, I want to make it clear we're not as with they Fantasy Flight games apologists. I love their stuff. I like the people at these companies. I don't agree with all these decisions. If they had not changed anything, I'd be happy with it. But the raising of prices thing, I just expect that to happen at some point. So I don't know. I know there's been a lot of feedback. I talked about this at great length on Board Game Breakfast and got a lot of feedback about that. And, you know, one of the things is, Tom, you don't have to buy games. Well, I actually do buy a lot of my Fantasy Flight stuff, the X-Wings and the Armada stuff. They don't send me that to review. And an Imperial Assault, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, I have to decide if I'm going to stay in those or not. I actually got out of X-Wing because I can't just keep afford to buying those ships for a game I don't mm. play that often. That was a decision yeah. I made. What I'm seeing online, I mean, I, I understand you can be irritated at these things, right? Like, oh, I wish they wouldn't do that. Oh, please don't do that. But I've seen people get angry, angry. Yeah. Uh, the hobby's huge. There are other places to move. A good example of this would be 40K. Warhammer, Games Workshop, was a pretty horrible company. They treated the people pretty pretty badly, and people went and played other games. I think yeah. the same thing is possible here. And if you love a game, let's say X-Wing, for example, they're not coming to your house and burning the stuff you have already. <laughs> it's true. But if you are wanting to go to you know, events and play in current tournaments... That's true. And those are the people who are going to have the toughest time with this decision. Although most of those people but they, are going they're to spending events, the money at their local stores. Right. And which so, I guess is the point. So there you have it. I don't know. Again, it's kind of an odd thing. Um, it's certainly a big announcement, although uh, you'll probably hear other big announcements over the next months or so. Hmm. Uh, I don't think merge. Some people say all mergers are bad. I don't think so. A good example would be Greater Than Games slash Dice Hate Me. I think their merger has been excellent for that company. Hmm. But you'll see. Other things will happen. There's other forces in play here. Let's just wait and see. Wait and see. Hey, let's merge with something, Eric. Ooh. Um, can we merge with like an ice cream company or Yes, Dave and Jerry's the Dice Tower. Or 
Is it Dave, Dave and, and Jerry? Jerry's? Dave Who's and, Dave and Jerry? Shut up. What is it? Dave and... Buster's? Forget them. Briar's Dice Tower. <laughs> I don't know if I want Briar's, though. You know what I want is Turkey Hill. Oh, We don't okay. have Turkey Hill down here in Florida. But when I was a ah. kid, they, were, they made the best ice cream. I like Gifford's up in Maine. Okay. Well, any local one. We'll yeah. merge with them. Okay. You send us free ice cream, we'll merge with you. <laughs> That's like the cheapest buyout ever. <laughs> so what did you sell the company for, Tom? Well, they gave me... A couple like, pints of ice cream. Unlimited cookie dough ice cream. What was I supposed to say? <laughs> they backed a truck full of ice cream to my house. I couldn't say no. All righty. Well, that's it for another show, folks. Lots of stuff going on. Thanks again for checking out our Kickstarter. Check out our website, DiceTower.com. Check out our videos. I should mention that because I haven't mentioned it yet. But if you were like, where's the Enhanced Podcast? It's gone. Yeah. However, we're putting the Enhanced Podcast up on YouTube now. So you can watch it. And I put pictures in there. Not tons of pictures, but some pictures. And you can even jump around in the show on YouTube if you want to. So that's that. All right, folks. Until next time, anyway, I'm Tom Vassell. I'm Eric Summerer. And you've been listening to The Dice Tower. Thanks for listening. Promotional consideration has been provided by game publishers in the form of review copies of games. This episode number 440 was recorded on December 29th, 2015. Coming up next week, it's our top 10 games from 2006, 10 years ago. This podcast is sponsored by listeners like you. Thank you for your continued support. And speaking of support, the Jack Vassal Memorial Fund is dedicated to providing support to members of the board gaming community in their hour of need. If a catastrophic event has turned your game upside down, find out how we can help at jackvassal.org. The Dice Tower is produced by Tom and me with assistance from Jason Thompson, Itai Perez, Eric Matthews, and Rob Searing. UPS Expose is provided by Post Stories. Timothy Pinkham composed our theme, and hosting is provided by Cool Stuff, Inc., where you can find great games at great prices at coolstuffinc.com. Let us know what you think of the show by posting to the Dice Tower Guild at boardgamegeek.com, liking us on Facebook, or by emailing us at thedicetower at gmail.com. And don't forget to visit the other shows in the Dice Tower Network, including The Broken Meeple, Flip the Table, On Board Games, The Plat Hat Podcast, The Party Game Cast, Board Games Insider, and Board Game University. Find out more at Dicetowernetwork.com. Until next time, from all of the gang at the Dice Tower, have fun gaming. Maybe we could merge with like a panini sandwich company. Ah, uh, I would do it with a, a sub sandwich company. Okay. Or or um a hog. The hog sandwiches. Yeah. The what? All right. Food. Food in general. Yeah, pretty much any food conglomerate. We're we're out here, Coke. We're we're ready for the buy-in. <laughs>